it's season three, and we're going to combine these two episodes for a number of reasons that we're going to get into, but we're back, and we're recording late because our lives have gotten kind of, well, super interesting, actually. We both have real full-time jobs now, and we're we're adult people, and, and our weekends are kind of the only time that we have to do whatever we want. And so, here is Masters of Podcasting for season three. Yay! Are you excited to be back, Conley? We're here! We're Yay. here, finally! Look at us. So, um, like I said, we're kind of going to discuss these two together, um, especially because, uh, not only because they've already kind of passed us by, but also because Michelle Ashford said in an interview that um, because of the legal, I don't know, not issues or troubles necessarily, but some legal maneuvering it sounded like, uh, they really intended for the season to get started in the third episode, it sounds like. Uh, So... I guess these first two episodes are kind of set up, and uh, they they were not universally well received. I think they were they got kind of mixed reviews, but um, I really liked them. I thought they were good episodes. Well, and I think what was most interesting about them to me was not just that you know we're further ahead in the future. The book is actually finally about to be released, and you know obviously Bill and Jenny have been working together for many many years now, but. It, I just like seeing the evolution of all these characters, less so the adults than the kids, just because, I mean, Henry and Tessie have just grown up to become the biggest brats in the whole (laughs) world, and I kind of love it. I I found myself, for me, the the whole nexus and really the draw of the show for me has been, honestly, and probably obviously, the relationship between Bill and Ginny. I really haven't found myself caring too much about secondary characters in the past, and I say that while acknowledging that actors like Alice and Janney and Bo Bridges are fantastic, they deserve the awards that they get, but I've never really been drawn into their storylines. Um, but some of the side characters that we were seeing in episodes one and two were interesting to me. I I liked the check-in with Henry and his stupid voice and Tessa and just her general brattiness and kind of the evolution of the Masters family and how it mysteriously keeps getting bigger and Libby keeps getting her way. And then in episode two, I thought Bill's long conversation with the Princess of Iran was really interesting and kind of, you know, maybe it was a little heavy-handed in paralleling his situation with Jenny, but I still, I still found myself interested in what she had to say and kind of what her her whole perspective on their situation, on her situation, really was. Well, and, and two things. A, when you're talking about Tessie and Henry, the fact that Henry gets so much play <laughs> and he looks like a pre-serum Captain America... He so does. ...is always hilarious to me. B, I just... It, it's interesting to me that they're obviously going to be touching on uh, the more clinical part of this research and how that factors into helping couples who are having all these infertility issues. Um, not just because it's, it's kind of after the book, what really not only makes them famous, but allows them to stay relevant, like throughout the, the changing times as you will, mm-hmm. but also just because it's, it's also kind of the, the linchpin that really changes their dynamic. You know, they're not just two researchers, doing this in private in a lab where no one else can see them and no one else can affect them. You know, this is actually, it's starting to bleed out and not necessarily affect real people, but they clearly are having much more of an impact on other people's lives than maybe they ever realized they would. Yeah. Even despite the nature of this research, which I kind of (laughs) love. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it's been surprising to me. I've seen a lot of people commenting on the various reviews And and it's interesting how people will say, well, I really loved the show when it was about the study. And my reaction to that is this show is not about the study. If you're drawn to the show because of the study, you're drawn to season one very precisely. Um, Each season kind of changes the purpose of, of kind of their business. So they start out with the study and then eventually they kind of branch out and it slowly kind of shows them figuring out that there could be two sides to this and now in season three now they're fully going to be getting into therapy and kind of oh because they've they've you know they've done the study it's over they've written this book they will eventually write a second book kind of about you know some similar supplemental issues but really the show is about bill and jenny's relationship and how they just completely fucked each other up and just fucked each other over yeah, I 
I mean, I, I completely agree. I mean, you can't, I feel like to it's, not that this is a medical procedural, but in your, like, if you had a regular medical procedural and you brought in a group of doctors or one doctor who, you know, you start in a hospital year one, the entire show is not going to be about that doctor, you know, just learning things and doing research in a lab and talking to the other low level interns. Like, there's going to be character evolution. There's going to be a lot of emotional, introspective. Uh, luggage at that point so to me it doesn't make sense to say oh I only like the show because of the study well I mean I think you have to reasonably expect of any show that it's not just going to be grounded in that singular focus forever you know obviously that's granted I would watch a show that featured the study prominently for you know nine ten seasons but that's just (laughs) me and so it's it's one of those things I think you have to keep an eye out for the ways that these characters are going to change and for the ways that, like you said, they're going to impact each other's lives for better or worse. Like it just, I don't think you can really watch not just this show, but any show without that expectation. I kind of wonder to what degree these first two episodes are almost like uh, season 2.75. If we're in, if if they're intending to kind of really truly begin season three with episode three, what does that say about how much is going to change when episode three airs? How much, you know, like in the past, quote unquote, can we consider episodes one two? It's almost like they're kind of a compact little capsule, and you know, are we supposed to treat them differently? Are things are is their relationship going to completely? you know, nosedive now that she's had a baby, now that, you know, she's back with George, now that all these changes have happened. It's kind of, it's kind of, I don't really know how to approach these two quite yet. And I don't think I will until I have the context of episode three. I think too, what was interesting is that, like you said, I think it really was intended. Maybe a lot of this was stuff that came out of the writer's room where they said, okay, you know, we've already done huge time jumps in the middle of season two. I don't think we can do another one. So let's just save this. You know, we're still working out some other things. So just, just write up a couple of episodes and we'll see where we land. Yeah. It it really, and I think I've heard somewhere where they're saying we really are not going to have a major time jump forward anytime soon. We kind of want to keep them right where they are right now. So to that end, I don't think we're going to see the, and honestly, if you need a spoiler alert at this point, why are you even listening to us? (laughs) Um, (laughs) The inevitable, music. the inevitable <laughs> divorce and marriage. Like I, I, I don't necessarily think it's going to happen by the end of this season. If it did, I'd be very surprised. I, I agree, but I also think that we'll see uh, Josh Charles really make a play for Jenny, and we'll kind of end the season on that serious note. The the will she, won't she? You know, it'll it'll. I think the season personally is going to end with those two paths kind of very obvious and laid out in front of Jenny. And then, you know, going into season four, then that will be the resolution of all of this drama. Well, and I kind of wonder because of the recent news that came out uh, about Judy Greer being on the show. Oh, I'm excited about that. I love Judy Greer. So I, I, I don't know how much you read about this because we haven't talked about this, but she's playing Josh Charles's wife. I saw that. And she's going to appear in the second to last episode, and it almost makes me wonder if we've had something major spoiled for us. If maybe this means that it's going to be like a confrontation dinner that Ginny doesn't know that this perfumier that she's been dating all season has been really intensely involved with is suddenly attached to something. I just, I'm, but then again, I'm not sure because that doesn't, that doesn't really follow history. But then again, this show has a knack for not following history the way that I think it's going to. So I, I don't make any prediction there, but I kind of wonder what's going to happen there if it isn't going to be kind of a oh we can't really be together in the first place after all because I'm almost wondering if this season is going to be bookended with that Patsy Klein song that we heard in the very beginning I think that's Patsy really Klein really song, important which I adore by the way you what a Patsy Klein song which I adore by the way <laughs> yeah I, I I feel like that's a really important central piece of music to reference and it's funny to me that this is not the first show that Michael Sheen has been in that has used that music as a key point he was in Spoils of Babylon and he wasn't a main character he only appeared in one episode but the two main characters who were 
it, it was complicated, but they were semi incestuously in love, and that that song would play. It was kind of their song, so it's just funny to Maybe me. Maybe Michael Sheen just really likes Patsy Cline. Maybe he does. Maybe he does. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think it's going to be interesting, especially like you said, because the show is kind of not playing fast and loose with history, but in a sense is not trying to stick to the biography as closely as I think we would have imagined, like in season one. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just, I'm interested to see where they take a lot of these characters for that reason exactly, um, because I think it gives them more creativity and more flexibility. A, it doesn't get them sued by any living you know, <laughs> masters or, or Johnson children. B. So true. <laughs> and and C, I just I like the idea that they can invent more characters because I think that will help them get around some roadblocks that a lot of historical shows encounter where, you know, you kind of have like the big plot points that you have to hit line by line by line, year by year. And then you don't really know how to write between them, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, when you have a historical show like this, where it's based on real events and using real people, um, a lot of times the danger is that, like you said, those secondary and tertiary characters and storylines can fall flat. And so everyone's eventually just tuning in for, you know, your high two as opposed to the ensemble as a whole. So I'm really excited that they're playing fast and loose with plot and with characters for that reason, because they have more license. And I think it'll make for, I hope it'll make for better storytelling in the long run. Plus, I think it's going to help them actually hit some of those beats in the biography that they would not have legally been able to hit otherwise. I think this daughter that Jenny has is going to be the one who is involved in the Doberman Pinscher incident later, like 15 uh-huh. years down the road. I think that's, you know, that, that opens up some other, some other possibilities and it also protects them from saying, well, Tessa is really, um, you know, the one, you know, and, and, and to, and to, and to have the, the cast of doubt over, well, was this daughter the one who hit on Bill in real life? I think they're just trying to avoid muddying the waters, but getting more mileage out of Tessa as the wild child, quote unquote, of the well, family. I really love what they're doing with her character this year. It's kind of refreshing that they didn't have all the children grow up to be, like, too perfectly mannered, you know? I... I was worried that they were going to have a Vivian on our hands or it would just be like, here's Tessa walking in when you need her. But I think they figured out her voice very well. And so that's that's really made me hopeful for the rest of the season as a whole. She's she's tense and she's bratty and she, I don't, I don't know, she was obnoxious, but she was not so obnoxious that I wanted her off the screen. It was like, she's there. She's clearly not getting along with her mother. They're having to tolerate and put up with each other. And then... You know, it was just the right amount for me. I don't know. Yeah, I agree. Um, for me, it was kind of, you get those shades of Paige Jennings and the Americans where, <laughs> um, <laughs> seriously, because, you know, you've got a kid who is an adolescent brat, but who also is smart and capable and can handle a lot and who has a lot of complicated stuff to sort through as opposed to one who's just kind of, I don't know, forever Jan Brady whining about, like, homework and boys and stuff. Yeah, plus I think she's, I mean, I think she, the actress said in an interview that she knows about the affair that her mother is having, so that's, that's a whole other level of, you know, like you say, Paige Jennings, you know, kind of getting in on the secret and not really knowing what to do with it and not really knowing who to turn to and having no one to talk to about this. Yeah, I'm just... <laughs> I hope that we get to see Tessa and Henry interact a little bit more this season, if nothing else, so they can both kind of sit at the table and be like, can you believe the shit our mom puts us through? Like, this is ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. But it's just, it's intriguing to me because I I think with these two episodes, the, like you say, all the stuff about family and secondary tertiary characters, in seasons past, those were so annoying to me. I felt like I was just waiting to get back to the main storyline. But in in and these see, two I loved them. <laughs> see, I I don't know. And these two episodes I wasn't as I didn't feel the lack of Bill and Ginny sex scenes felt quite so I don't know, like like gloom, like a pall over the episodes. It was just kind of like I I guess because they they've kind of switched tack to be more about their 
personal emotional relationship, I guess, because it's gotten away from employer and employee and more equal, you know, treating each other as equals, that it, it feels, mm, it feels stylistically satisfactory in a different way. Like, it, it, I don't know, how, I don't know if I'm putting this correctly. It's almost like those are as emotionally satisfying to the story as the usual sex scenes would be. Now, that's not to say that those are not unwelcome. I'm just saying <laughs> that the intimacy between the characters has has grown and developed and, and is on a really good level right now. Now, it could all be completely scuttled by episode three. I don't know. The previews kind of made it seem like Bill's really interested in, you know, getting back down to business and Ginny's kind of lost interest in their sexual relationship. Yeah, um, what I'm really interested to see, not just the emotional intimacy, um, and I think one of the reasons that this, the first two episodes have been so successful for me is because they really have a strong sense of Libby this season and kind of her clear motivations going in and coming out. And I think there's a lot of material to work with there and they, they seem to have that voice much more focused, which I think is one of the reasons why all these um, emotional scenes have, have worked so well just because it's not just about, oh, well, they have this amazing chemistry, this amazing bond, you know, their intimacy is so much more clear than Bill and Libby's ever was and, or Ginny and George's. Um, but, but on the whole, like you said, I think it's, it's good that we are exploring this part of their relationship as much or more than the sexual part right now. Yeah. Just because I think the danger is that it could get, you know, you can get too wrapped up in the physicality of it and not realize that, like you said earlier, hey, these two people, you know, have known each other for, at this point, it's what, over 10 years, yeah. 15 years? Yeah, yeah. You know, they, they work together side by side, day in, day out. They're having this affair. You know, their families are basically joined at the hip because of it. No one can say anything. And it's, so there's so many, I think, mitigating factors that have complicated this relationship to a point where we we have to kind of let a little pressure off of that valve or else it's, you know, you can't tell the story that you want, I think. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, and I, I liked having um, <laughs> those interesting kind of coded scenes with Libby and Ginny where they, you know, are really talking about what they they both know what they're talking about and they're arguing about it, but no one ever comes out and directly says it, and no one really even comes close to blurting it out that I can I just see. I love that. I love how purposeful those scenes were because it wasn't one of those things where they're arguing and somebody yells, you know, I know you're sleeping with Bill. You know, it, it was nothing like that. It was it was all very, you know, there was there was a lot of anger, there was yelling, there were people getting frustrated, but at the same time, it was very measured as you know what they said to each other and how they said it and the way that they framed the entire you know, problem i just love that i loved it the one thing that stuck with me from their first argument when libby just apparently burst into jenny's house and like started yelling at her was the way <laughs> libby said you know bill is a magical thinker and bill is going to treat this as a joint effort between the two of you what did you think when she said that like like how did that how did that sit with you um, I'm trying to remember what came right before it because, I mean, she burst into the house and she's yelling. To, it just... to me, it seemed as if um, it was like Libby was saying, you know, everything between the two of you has been a collaboration, this too. But it wasn't so much an argument about, well, you know, obviously this is his child. It didn't seem to go toward anything like that because it was as if they had put that aspect of it behind themselves. I thought Libby was, you know, demonstrating a bit of a bit of insight into Bill's character that maybe Ginny doesn't have as much of a read on or has never really addressed as a character on the show. But I think the writers may be foreshadowing, and this is a long shot, I realize, and it's, you know, it, it could be impossible, but it's possible that, you know, someone like Bill, if, if Jenny does get involved with another man, I mean, Bill could wind up transferring some of his affections for Jenny onto this child is kind of what I took away from that. Well, and I think, 
too, it's not just it's not just a kind of like keeping up with the Joneses kind of argument where, you know, obviously Bill and Lin- Bill and Libby were married. They begrudgingly or not had children together. You know, Jenny had her children and she and Bill started working together. So it's not just that Jenny is kind of slowly but surely gaining everything that Libby had, parentheses and more. Um, but like you said, I think it's also not just that Libby, I, I don't think Libby is necessarily framing this as, oh, well, Bill is definitely the father of your baby. You know, I, I think she realizes that whether or not Bill thinks the baby is his, it's going to be something that affects whatever relationship the three of them have tenuously built together with the workarounds for, you know, the affair and, and whatnot. But it, I, I think Libby is kind of recognizing that for all that they've tried to smooth over, there are always going to be holes in this road and they're not going to be able to avoid them anymore. And at that point, I think she would truly worry about her marriage breaking up, which is why she pushes so hard for Jenny to marry George. Which kind of goes toward her comment when she's sitting on the couch and Bill is attempting to fix the TV. Um, What is it? She says something like, I always thought Jenny was a woman of her word. I don't think she's even so much saying, well, you know, oh my God, you had this kid with my child. It's more like you promised that you weren't going to do anything to disrupt the careful and delicate balance that we have going on right now with what we have right now. And here you've gone and upset this by doing this thing. You did something unpredictable, and now this is happening. It's kind of like the impulsivity behind, well, you know, we we arranged things. We got this all laid out. You know, we're we're doing the the co-parenting weird thing with Bill, and now you've just gone and ruined it because you only think of yourself. Which is, you know, (laughs) so interesting from Libby because it's like, well... What is it that you've been doing and, and your need for children? Like, it's, it's, there are parallels, and yet Libby seems to think you could argue that Ginny is acting selfishly, kind of in the same way that Tessa accuses Ginny of acting selfishly. Well, and I feel like, too, you know, I kind of, I do see their point, because it's not, at least from an, an outside perspective, I feel like you can definitely see someone who expresses a desire for something like, Oh, I really want to be a mother. I want to have children, blah, blah, blah. If they keep saying that all the time, people, not that they will, wouldn't discount that wish, but it's, it's kind of planted in people's heads. Like, okay, this is the goal. This is the idea. And so for Jenny, who for years and years has just been, you know, focused on her career and focused on the book and for Jenny to suddenly accidentally wind up pregnant I think it's just it feels like an insult to Libby in a lot of ways but particularly because Jenny has been so adamant about no I'm done with kids I'm done with George I'm done with all this I just want to focus on you know the research yeah Jenny gets plenty of I mean not plenty of but she gets more latitude to make choices about her her desires and her sense of fulfillment than Libby ever has right and, yeah. and for Libby, you know, the, the dream was the, the marriage and the two kids and the white picket fence. And, you know, she realizes that she can never have that. And now, you know, whatever she's managed to pull together for herself is just, you know, slowly teetering on the precipice. And I yeah. think that, you know, is, is definitely going to anger her in a lot of ways. And I'm really interested to see, again, where they take Libby this season because of that. Because I think, you know, when you when you have this character who has realized so much of her life is false and who has kind of made peace with the different things she's had to settle for throughout the years and then have her turn that on its head and be like, you know what? No, I'm not playing nice anymore. This is what you get from me world. I just love that. Yeah. How do we feel about this was kind of almost glossed over in a way, but how do we feel about bill just like, I don't know, just kind of arranging this remarriage between Ginny and George and just kind of forcing them back together again. Like, you, you, we don't really get much pushback from Ginny on this. Well, I honestly think Ginny is so, like, not necessarily lost, but I think she's just so overwhelmed by everything that's happening that she doesn't even know how to 
fight her corner in this case, if that makes sense. Mm. You know, because she, she kind of, she talks about, okay, well, it's a terrible idea. We can't do it. But then she's got such vehement opposition on both fronts. And then she's got Jordan in her face saying, oh, well, you know, why don't we do this? I still love you. It's probably going to be fine this time. <laughs> it just To me, I think she's kind of falling back on that fear that, okay, well, if she doesn't do this, she's out. You know, she's going to be replaced by this random gynecologist and her life will be exactly the way it was before only she'll be you know 15 years older still with no degree and you know no applicable work history and she'll have to go back to what she did had earlier Mm -hmm. which is nothing Mm -hmm. It it to her mind I think I thought it was interesting that the way the wedding scene played out was pretty much the same way that Thomas Mayer described uh, Bill and Jenny's wedding in the book. It was like they just had it done in the living room of some friends, and that was it. <laughs> it's pretty much the same thing, which makes me wonder if they're if they're heading like for a courthouse. Like, do you? I do. Do you? I do. End. Done. <laughs> done. Yeah, I can't. I don't necessarily see them having a white wedding of the century, but <laughs> that would be a very hilarious moment. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then the one other big thing for these episodes is we can't, we can't not do this. Like we've been trying so hard to philosophize and like be really analytical about this, but you know, we were, we were saying before we started this episode, well, we want to do less just like reacting to plot points, but we're going to react now to the plot point of Bill comforting uh, Ginny during labor and singing to her, which was... When I watched it with some friends on the couch, we just all screamed at exactly the same moment and kind of lost the thread of what was happening apart from Bill singing. I'm just, I'm so sad that I got spoiled for that moment. It was a beautiful moment and I I definitely had a little squeal in private, but it just, ugh. I, I saw it just set and it was glorious, but I know that that surprise would have been even better. It was... It was perfect. It was just so perfect because it was just so, so totally out of character and unexpected. And maybe it kind of folds into the whole narrative that we're getting. Bill slowly getting softer and Ginny kind of becoming more bitter and hardened. But it was just, it was, it was nice. And it was nice that, you know, he, he kind of played it as a, look, now we know more about each other moment. And he was just so nice and experienced and, I don't know. I loved it. I loved everything about it. It was refreshing it. to see him be a competent doctor as opposed to, you know, Dr. Roboto. Yes, definitely. Yeah. I, what, what was it that I texted to you? Like, he has a third subroutine reaction in his programming? <laughs> yeah. Mm. And then I just sang Domo Arigato, Dr. Roboto to myself oh, for Dr. a couple Roboto. hours later. So great. But his little his little speech, one of the people that I watch it with said, well, you know, he's just telling her how to be a good mother. And that's kind of, you know, I'm, I'm sort of sick of men on television telling women how to do things. But if this is what nice Bill is, then I think we could stand to appreciate and enjoy it while it lasts. Because inevitably, this is going to be turned into something shitty later on. Like, he's going to behave horribly in the next episode or something. I don't know. So, you know, we have to take these little, these adorable little moments while we can. Well, and I think that's why it made this little moment so nice was just because, you know, you got to see that that same awkward affect, but at the same time, he was actually expressing genuine empathy for someone. Yeah. And so I couldn't be mad. I just couldn't. Like, you, 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 it, it. The fact, yeah, it's like you actually kind of want to give him a medal for being a decent, like, normal human being. It's such an achievement for him. I know. You realize people have human feelings. Good job. Good job, Bill. You're treating Jenny the way you always should have now that she's a patient, now that she's a case for you to look after, kind of. (laughs) Um, I thought it raised some some questions uh, that will never be answered about Bill... And his taste in music, like why, why that song? Was it just sub- the first thing that he came to off the top of his head? Like, if you think about it, what kind of music would Bill Masters actually listen to and like be able to sing? And like, why that song? And why not something else? 
<laughs> it's an all old English ballad. Like, is he in the shower singing Scarborough Fair? Yeah, I mean, like, like does <laughs> does he know any Gilbert and Sullivan? Could he have sung, you know, I don't know, Dance a Kachucha to her or something? <laughs> These are these are legitimate questions. These are legitimate questions. We need answers, writers. We need them now. Yeah, yeah. We're never going to see them. Oh, did you want to talk about Libby and the Syrax, the antidepressants, in episode one? I mean, I'm I'm a little surprised <laughs> that she's managing to get away with having a prescription underneath Bill's nose, but at the same time, he doesn't seem to be around very much and obviously isn't paying attention to her. Because I think the way the writers had it set up in episode one was that uh, Bill's been living with Ginny for a while, and the way that he kind of pays recompense for that is spending little bursts of time here and there with his wife and his children. Um, but yeah, I think it's obvious that something really bad happened to Robert in the hiatus. Um, we're just waiting at this point to see what it is. Yeah, I'm. it's not looking good for poor Robert, and I am sad for that. Yeah, yeah. And obviously that's taken a huge toll on Libby because she doesn't feel, you know, she's she obviously doesn't feel like she has that emotional intimacy with someone her own age and kind of on the same level with her. Um, she's just got all these children to deal with. Yeah, she's kind of, <laughs> this is this is definitely not the ideal OT3 because two of them just go off and have this emotional intimacy and this great sex and here she is just like, okay, make sandwiches, go to bed now. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously yeah. come along if you need me. Mm-hmm. Did you want to talk about, did you read the news um, about Allison Janney coming back with her, her new love interest? Spoiler I, alert. I, I saw that. I saw that she's like, the, the storyline is that she hasn't had sex for so long that she, now she's wanted to try everything. I'm not sure if it's a, like, they're they're coming to the clinic to be trained in how to treat each other or if she's looking for something specific. I'll, I, I would like to see where that goes. Apparently I can't find the words. <laughs> I'm just interested. It's the bottom line. It's interesting. That's all we need to know. <laughs> That's what it is. Compelling TV yeah. starting now. Um, then we have the fur coat. Uh, I, I'm assuming, given the little bits and pieces of auditions that we've seen come out, that that is going to be exchanged for the Vicuña coat, because that <laughs> fur wrap, that fur wrap is not what Vicuña looks like. I am shaking my finger at my computer screen right now. That's not what it looks like. I cannot wait to see it in its full glory. Oh, I'm so excited. Been waiting so long for this. And then let's see. I think we may have a flashback to Bill and Libby's wedding because Caitlin Fitzgerald was in a wedding dress at one point, and Ginny's parents are going to be showing up, as foreshadowed in episode one when she just randomly drops like some line about I think Tessa's been talking to my mother, like out of the blue. And I'm excited to see that because it means we're gonna see Francis Fisher. And Francis Fisher as a mean mom, I'm always here for. <laughs> Good, Always. Good, good. And I, I'm thinking uh, the, the pictures from episode five that came out make it look like uh, she's the one who figures out that Bill's been living with Jenny because apparently Jenny has a few of his bow ties in the wash. I always love when the moms get wise to their kids' indiscretions. It's I don't a, know why. I it, just love that trope so it much. It kind of surprised me that her parents weren't there for the birth. I don't know. I guess I didn't really think about it that much because I remember in the biography that Jenny wasn't particularly close to her parents. So it That's didn't true. strike me as like, oh no, they should be there. Well, and I guess I, I assumed from reading the biography that her mother would have just sh- pushed and shoved and elbowed her way down there and just kind of in like, like Jenny says, insinuated herself into her life. Right. So maybe, maybe their presence is kind of the aftermath of all of this. Oh, I just, I love, I love seeing the parents. I loved it last mm-hmm. season. I love it even more if, once we meet Jenny's parents. It'll be good. It'll be good. Do we have any last words? We, we had a uh, an audience question about Bill and Tessa and how we think they got to be so close in the interval between time jumps. And at least from my perspective, I don't necessarily think that they are that close, but I certainly see where Tessa would have become fascinated with him, if not be- because she has a crush on him or because she has feelings for him, but certainly because she sees her mother maybe acting either like an idiot or being under his spell. I think she would definitely find that 
either disturbing or notable or both and would probably devote a lot of time to trying to understand why him, why that, why now. I think it's kind of a combination of that. For me, it's that Bill is the only stable, steady pr- male presence in her life, but he's not paternal at all. I'm just happy the show is back. Me too. Me too. <laughs> It'll be an interesting season to see kind of if these if these two episodes are setting things up, where all these things go. It'll be interesting to see if the writers attempt to get me on the side of Josh Charles having sex with Ginny, because let me tell you right now, that is not going to happen. There is no way that I will be sympathetic to that. It's, you, you, we, no, this is a Sisyphean task. I'm sorry. <laughs> we in this audience are immune to the Will Gardner charm. Look, <laughs> look, my favorite ship off that show was Alan Cumming and America Ferreira, and no one is going to tell me otherwise. No one. <laughs> I'm high-fiving you right now. High-five, high-five, high-five. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. my dreams. <laughs> yes. If we ever start a Good Wife podcast, you can hear all about it. <laughs> oh, Lord. We'd have so many back episodes to do. <laughs> yeah, I oh, know. Christ. All right. Well, that leaves us. Uh, that's our analysis for episodes one and two. We'll be very interested to see where episodes three and the rest of the season go because Josh Charles, it looks like, is going to be recurring through the end of the season, possibly beyond. Um, so we'll see where it goes from there. And... Um, If you guys have questions or you want to drop us a message on our Tumblr, we would love it. We always love getting your messages. Yes, we love hearing from you. And thank you for messaging us and talking to us and all that good stuff. So we will see you next time. Woo! Thank you for listening. Bye-bye. Bye.